Last but certainly not least today, we have uh, the Nessie graduate assistant, Ben Fellman, Benjamin Fellman. Um, ben was a participant in the program two years ago, and we somehow persuaded him to come back last year as a graduate assistant to support Nessie and other, our other student programs, and then got him back again this year. So, so happy to have you here, Ben, and um, I'm excited to introduce your oral presentation, which is Scientists Connecting the Past, Current, and Future Innovations and Responsibilities We Hold. Ben joins us from the University of Oklahoma, um, and I guess I was kind of your mentor, right? Okay. <laughs> um, so yeah, about to start my second year, my PhD at University of Oklahoma. And for my presentation today, I was kind of going through a few different ideas of what I wanted to present, but I felt like a really cool culmination presentation for today, I'd be talking about connecting the past, current, and future innovations and responsibilities we hold as scientists. And I think to kind of start the presentation, I want to start off my journey to becoming a scientist and how I'm here in this position today. So to start, in 99, I was born. I know I'm outing myself with my age here. But in 1999, I think kind of was the start of this love of meteorology for myself. But it wasn't until 2012 that I really experienced some form of an impactful weather event that really got me kind of starting my love for meteorology. And this was a major derecho that started as a supercell thunderstorm all the way in Iowa and translated into a damaging line storm that impacted, as you can kind of see here in the orange box, my hometown area of um, the DMV. And I think the biggest part about this event wasn't just the fact that a few people were killed from the storm, but it was the fact that a heat wave followed this event. And many of the vulnerable populations were unable to get any AC. And as a result, we actually saw double the amount of people pass away from the impacts following this storm. And I also saw this as well kind of in 2018. I was fortunate enough through Millersville University to attend um, and participate in a emergency kind of disaster relief trip with the university in San Juan, Puerto Rico, about nine months after Hurricane Maria. And for me, it was a shock to see how much damage was still left nine months after the storm. But what was really cool is we went to the communities and we told them, listen, we're coming into your country. We're coming into these areas that are damaged. How can we help you? How can we you know, provide assistance? And kind of going into Indu's presentation, that middle picture there was actually um, a wetlands area that had mangrove for us. And we learned that the mangroves really do help with kind of alleviating some of this tidal surge. Those mangroves were completely destroyed from the hurricane. And we actually came in and were using machetes that you can kind of see from that picture there to destroy all of those endangered plants that had already grown in those areas, really to help with kind of the preservation again of those mangroves in that area. So from this kind of um, experience, I graduated from Millersville and I learned that I really wanted to get into research and really start my graduate work. And that picture is me of my first day at the University of Oklahoma back almost three years ago. And at Oklahoma, I was really interested in pursuing an additional opportunity in research, being able to connect with others. And I was fortunate enough to intern with the Nessie program. We have here our cohort from our first and last day and a picture of us at True Colors. And I think that kind of leads me here to today, where from my experiences of Nessie and transitioning my research and finding a love and passion of working with students, I've now found myself working in social science areas while also being able to support students in ways that I have with Nessie. So that's a little bit about my journey to becoming a scientist. What does the actual definition that we see in a textbook or a dictionary say? So Merriam-Webster Dictionary states that a scientist is a person learned in science and especially natural science, a scientific investigator. We love definitions that use the word repeatedly in them. <laughs> um, but my question for you all is, and I might pick a person or two in the audience, what does it mean to you to be a scientist? What is the first thing that comes to you when you think of yourself as a scientist? Curiosity. Curiosity, OK. You can shout it out. It's fine. Perseverance. Perseverance. Truth-seeking. Truth Responsibility. Responsibility. That's a great one. So within all of this, and kind of the way that I phrase, or I'm kind of organize the presentation, I've thought about investigating what it has meant to be a scientist, but specifically a meteorologist or an atmospheric scientist from three different lenses. We have what we've learned from the past. We have what we're dealing with right now in the present. And then moving forward into the future, what we are going to need to learn and kind of you know, 
evaluate how we're doing our science and what it's going to look like 10, 20, 30 years into the future. So past roles and responsibilities of atmospheric scientists. Well, we needed to start somewhere. Scientists were responsible for creating the science. We were responsible for beginning to generate these innovations and these new discoveries. And this includes weather-specific innovations that have helped advance our understanding of the atmosphere. So let's kind of go through like an example or two of this. So we're going to go all the way back to 1946. And this is when the first WSR-1 radar was actually invented. These came into, I think, usage during World War II, but we saw them really being implemented from a meteorological standpoint in the 40s and into the 50s. Now, throughout time, we've continually innovated and tried updating these products in order to get them to more of what the science of what we want. And we've seen this progression in 1991, the NEXRAD radar system, which is a system of hundreds of radars across the United States, was implemented. And so in the past, we had really been working toward creating these new projects to help define and kind of identify the science and what we're dealing with in meteorology. Now, as our current role of scientists, we still hold that past responsibility of advancing the science. It's a little bit harder because we've done a lot of research to kind of answer these questions, but there's still things in this present day of age that we're still trying to answer. And kind of tying into the work that I do within um, my research at the University of Oklahoma, scientists, especially over the last 10 to 20 years, have discovered a gap of predictability in the weather and climate forecasting at the subseasonal to seasonal time scale. So you'll see from this plot here, let's see if I can get the laser working. There we go. So on the left here, we show the time scale of prediction of weather. We do a great job of predicting weather one, three, five days out, kind of decreases as far as seven to 10 days in advance. We also do a great job of these seasonal outlooks. Some of the work with ENSO that Ryan presented and the predictability of these oscillations is actually well known. But we found recently that there is this lack of predictability on this subseasonal to seasonal time scale, two weeks to two months in advance. And it's been a big initiative in this current area of research because certain phenomena such as heat waves, cold air outbreaks, pluvial periods can be forecasted on this time scale. And research has successfully been able to do that. And as a result, we now have these new innovative products that can be distributed and used. So the example that I've shown for you here is one from the Climate Prediction Center of a week three through four temperature outlook. So research from what we've done in the past to what we're currently doing now has allowed us to be able to forecast kind of what temperature may be looking like three to four weeks in advance. So helping with the decision making and predictability of what weather may look like. Now, in addition to creating these new products, a new area of research and kind of what we've seen from presentations from Ariana and Judy in the social science is understanding how people may perceive weather and the science and the significant increase in research focused on these concepts. So kind of tying in with a little bit of research I was able to also do along the way here this summer, kind of within my dissertation, I was really interested in studying people's experiences, risk perceptions to these defined subseasonal to seasonal events. So in the research I'm working in now, we were able to use the survey data and sample the risk perceptions and um, perceived experience of both flash drought, so that rapid drought intensification was brought up in Caitlin's talk, and heat waves of public members in Oklahoma. And I'll preface this with the five waves of survey data we looked at, a heat wave and flash drought event occurred right before the third wave. And so from this plot here, we asked people to give their risk perceptions on a one to five scale of flash drought and heat waves during each point in time. And what we can see here is that as people were experiencing that event for both the heat waves and the flash drought, the risk perceptions were increasing. And so this research is helping us to be able to identify and see, you know, how do people think about the weather? How do they um, perceive their experiences to it in current time? We can look at it from a future risk perception as well, too, showing very similar results. And then we can also look at other ways of being able to identify how people perceive the weather and the differences that they do. And so within our survey in wave three, we asked the proportion of respondents, how many of you believe that you were experiencing a flash drought? We want to be able to understand, do people actually recognize these meteorological terms across the state? Especially in a state like Oklahoma, where we deal with just about everything, tornadoes, snow, ice, hail, you name it, we pretty much got it. So during this wave of the survey, this is kind of looking at five regions of the state of Oklahoma. We can see here that about 80% of respondents between all five of these regions acknowledged that they had experienced a heat wave. They recognized their experience, they understand the term. But when we looked at it with a flash drought, and mind you, we provided definitions for all of these events too, we see that there are clear differences in the, um, 
one number of um, people or percentage of people who perceive to experience these events. But there's also this regional variety that also occurs, likely due to the fact that in areas of the Southwest and North Central Western areas of Oklahoma receive far less rainfall in comparisons to areas further east. And so we recognize that there may also be differences based on the location of where people live and the way that they perceive weather. So that's our current role as scientists. Moving forward into the future, I think there's gonna be a few things that we're really gonna to need to think about. One, we are going to reach a limit of predictability when it comes to weather, especially because of the small scale, micro scale, complex interactions that occur. There is a certain limit of predictability that we will inevitably hit with meteorology. But I think the other big thing to point out in the future is that we're really dealing with what has been defined as these wicked problems or these issues that require the expertise of multiple fields and perspectives to begin solving. And so traditionally with weather, I feel like we've always just heard of the forecasting aspect of it. But weather has such close implications with a number of other fields that we will see currently now and moving forward into the future. Agriculture and farming, kind of heard about that from Judy a little bit. Water conservation, city planners, the sharing and storage of data, especially with data that may contain personable, personable identifiable information, data sharing as well too, the communication of weather information, artificial intelligence, which we have seen in just a few years has already taken our field by storm and will likely continue to have influence. And then health impacts, especially with what we see with certain storms. And I kind of wanted to show this and the interconnectedness through a few examples of how all of these different fields work and kind of collaborate together with weather. So let's kind of work on an example. Example one, something that Ariana and Giancarlo may have dealt with in their project. How do you communicate information on a major hurricane that will make landfall in Miami in 24 hours? Who are you going to be working with? Because it's not just meteorologists that are gonna be working together to solve this issue of preparing people. It's first gonna start with the hurricane forecast, you know, looking at a week out in advance, are we able to identify this hurricane? Being able to then talk to emergency managers, partners of um, um, this information, being able to disseminate it, then talking to city planners, working all together, you know, to solve this wicked issue and problem of how do we make sure people are going to may, remain as resilient as possible? And then we have that interconnectedness between the emergency managers and the forecasters, the health impacts that can come not only during the hurricane itself, but following it. If we see that power is not out, resources aren't able to come in. The connection between these health impacts with emergency managers, and then also that connection with artificial intelligence and forecasting. That was a lot of words and a lot of arrows and a lot of lines. But I hope that the main takeaway that you can see from here is that with these wicked problems, it's going to take more than just meteorologists to solve them. And while our role is critical in facilitating, um, you know, making sure that people may remain resilient during these events, we're gonna rely on working with a lot of different people and a lot of different groups. And I think another example, which <laughs> kind of have ongoing right now, just across from Boulder County, of wildfire. So increasing wildfires pose greater risks to air quality. We talked about and saw this in your presentation, Maddie, of how ozone and NOx can cause significant impacts to health. So how do we talk about this? What is the process for this? Well, here we go. We start again, wildfire with forecasting, but then again, working with city planners, the health impacts, the forecasting with the city planners. We again see here the interconnectedness between these meteorological events and the groups of people that we'll need to work with together moving forward to kind of tackle these wicked problems. So kind of going from that, I think there are a few things that we can consider moving forward as atmospheric scientists and scientists in general. One, in a changing world with a changing climate, it is likely that our roles and responsibilities we hold as atmospheric scientists will change. It is very unlikely that we will stay in the same job for our entire careers. And I think that kind of that mindset of, you know, being adaptive and being ready to integrate your research into other fields is extremely necessary. So whether that's taking additional classes at universities or pursuing additional minors, having that expertise not only in meteorology may set you apart and will allow you to be able to complete additional research outside of just this discipline of atmospheric science. Next one, use this internship experience and future opportunities as a stepping stone to identify future research areas outside of atmospheric science that interest you. This internship program is a great, great way to get exposed to a bunch of different research. The project that you worked on this summer may be the research you continue doing for the rest of your life. Maybe it isn't. The work that I did two summers ago has just come to a close and I'm moving on to a new chapter. And so I think it's a really unique opportunity to really understand what excites you and also what doesn't. And then last but not least, 
be involved in projects, research, or work that you are passionate about. I think if there's one thing that I've kind of learned from my time, especially in graduate school, is that if you're working on projects that don't motivate you, it's going to be a really, really hard time. And that you should really be most interested in finding the work that excites you, that makes you passionate about the work that you're completing, because it will show through with your research. Then with that, I just wanted to take a moment to acknowledge a bunch of people. Jerry, it's been a great honor to be with you again this summer, year three. And it's been an incredible opportunity, very different from the last two years, but again, such an incredible experience. Nessie cohort, y'all have been great. It's been awesome to work with you all this summer and be able to see all of your presentations and the hard work that you've done. Sci Parks, Virginia, it's been great to work with you again this summer. Eva, oh wait, hold on. There we go. <laughs> Don't think I left you out, Eva. You have been so great at, to work with this summer. And I'm going to miss our car rides and our chats and expect FaceTime calls from me in the middle of the day when I'm freaking out about something. Um, to all the internship leads, my um, mentors and faculty at OU IPRA and the Storm Prediction Center and all the interns, visitors, and students I've been able to work with, thank you so much. It's been a great summer, and I'm not ready to leave, but I guess it's coming to a close. I'm happy it's happened, and I'm so happy that we were all able to meet. So with that, I guess I'll take questions. Yeah. <laughs> Wonderful work, Ben. Some questions? I have, um, it's not really a question, it's more of a comment. If you go back to your slide that's like about the, the flash drought. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah, so, sorry. <laughs> no, you're good. Um, my advisor actually wrote a paper that uh, talks about how or like concludes that there's like people feel like events are getting less and less extreme. Like there's like a very much a new normal that's happening. I will send it to you. I think you'd find it interesting. Yeah. I just wanted to like say that because I think it kind of relates, but um, yeah, there's this, this risk perception is like getting things are getting less abnormal to people. I think as, as they, as things get more frequent. Yeah. It's interesting because, so in the paper, we look at the risk perceptions for eight different phenomena. One, it's like tornadoes, hail, flooding, snow and ice, flash drought, heat waves, cold air outbreaks, fluvial periods. What was interesting, though, is the risk perception for tornadoes, which you would think in Oklahoma, was statistically significantly higher than almost all the other risk perceptions. So I guess that makes sense. Yeah, no, but it was interesting as well because... Um, when it, looking at snow and ice and other events that are more of the wintertime aspect, the risk perceptions were between about 2.5 and 3, which on a 1 to 5 scale in comparison to risk perceptions that are above 4 mm -hmm. is quite significant. Um, yeah. So I want to read that article, though. Yeah, I'll send it to you. I just wanted yeah. to, like, before I forget. Yeah, because this also, mind you, too, is just a sample. It's from a survey that's just administered through the state of Oklahoma, so it is only public members of Oklahoma. Okay. So I, oh, cool. <laughs> Thanks. Other questions for Ben? <laughs> All right, you had um, artificial intelligence as one of your yes. modules. How do you see that changing um, scientists' um, roles or atmospheric scientists' roles moving forward? How much do you think it's going to impact the way in which you do science? I think that that could be up to us to a certain degree. Because I think that if we are very intentional with the ways that we use AI, it can be kind of used more so as a tool rather than as a replacement. So I think, especially within the weather world, there's certain things that humans can do that AI cannot do. So for example, certain models may have a slight um, bias in their temperature, a slight bias in certain variables. And as meteorologists, especially for those who are trained years and years and years, they recognize those patterns. It's weird. And sometimes I'm like, I don't know how they can do that. But especially for people who have that experience, they can do better in some instances than AI. Now, AI, I know from what I've seen, will add a significant amount of knowledge to meteorology. I think that it's important that we use AI more so as a tool, kind of as I was talking about, and kind of to assist us in the decision-making process 
not to kind of use it more so as a replacement for us as atmospheric scientists. So I hope that kind of answered your question. It did. It's a tool that you have to use your expertise to check the results. Exactly. So yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Yeah. No. <laughs> uh, so I think this question is definitely uh, anticipated. Who's your favorite? <laughs> no. no. That's horrible. <laughs> no, I'm no. kidding. I'm kidding. I have an actual. I have an actual question. I have an actual question. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so my actual question is, a lot of times, at least, maybe this is just more me on a personal level, but when I'm studying something that I find super interesting, I find myself diving through every single like hole that I could oh possibly God. find, and I find myself working on three to four different like alleyways of a project, and uh, don't, get, don't get me wrong, the energy is still there. It's more of just kind of like a, oh, you know, I wish I could maybe finish this part and then move on, but I don't know. How do you... In your, in your expertise, how, how have you kind of combated that? In like the last year, I have learned the power of saying the word no. Oh, and yeah. let me tell you that it is so amazing. <laughs> but no, but seriously though, I think one of the biggest things that I've learned and realized is there's only so much that you can do before you really do spread yourself too thin and it kind of makes everything less, it's less beneficial for everything that you want to do. And so what I found really helpful for myself is like, I will keep timelines of projects and like, for example, the paper I'm working on with this, like I already have it set out. I wanted a draft done by end of July. I want this kind of finalized by September, October. I want it out for submission whenever. And for me, even just timelining out tasks, you're able to kind of see where projects may overlap, where you know you may have periods of time where you have two or three things going on but the power of saying no and writing kind of and organizing everything that I have was really, really helpful with that, especially with the transition from going from master's research, which was on a whole different concept of like physical mechanisms of flash drought versus now risk perception, social science. Um, that definitely saved me in that transition this last year. Yeah, say no. <laughs> Fantastic work, Ben. Thank you. Thank you. Well, that concludes uh, 2024 Nessie oral presentations. Congratulations Yay. to all the Nessie presenters. One down, right? <laughs>